Hey everybody, today I want to talk about the difference between hub worlds and open worlds. Now the obvious difference is that a hub world is a place where the player is going to visit it a lot. But it's more complicated than that, because the hub world is the primary way that you'll be talking to your player. And that means that the hub world is going to get redressed a lot. That might include things like texture changes or lighting changes. For example, it's a Halloween party, so it's at night and it's got fake spiders hanging from the roof or whatever. But it can also just include things like there's different people there and they have different things to say. Those are all set redresses and hub worlds are really, really, um, that, that's what you do with them. You redress them because that's the way you talk to the player. You say, this chapter is about the Halloween party. Here's how you should feel. Here's the people you should talk to. Here's what they have to say. Here are the side quests. Here's the plot points. That's very hard to do in an open world. The open world is more about discovering things on your own uh, and, you know, having a static or pseudo-static environment. Um, hub worlds are all about allowing you to talk to the player about what the game is about this very instant. You can see that sort of thing in, uh, for example, um, Night in the Woods. Night in the Woods redresses its sets for the Halloween party and it works very well. But let's talk about something a little bit older and easier to approach. Let's talk about Psychonauts. Psychonauts is fun to talk about because it's so old that they couldn't have a large hub world. They were forced to have teeny tiny little hub worlds. For example, their main hub world is a cabin like this. And it's got uh, a sunny area over here where people can just go and sun or whatever. Uh, and it's got a set of stairs, and it's got an interior, which is just three rooms. And it's got an entryway here, and an entryway down here, and then something over on the far side that you can't see, but it's another entryway, and it goes down to the beach. So it's a hub world, but it's just one building, and then there's some jumping puzzles, because why not? So... This is a super simple hub world. Like, wow, right? Would you ever think about it making your hub world one building, three rooms, that's it? That's um, pretty small, but that's actually not a bad idea. One of the big problems I see with people making hub worlds is that they make huge hub worlds. And it's like, oh, well, my RPG maker game, my hub world is going to be a whole city. And it's going to be like 85 buildings and 14 screens and full, you know, fully realistic. And it's going to be like 14 stores. And no, please, please don't do that. Make it really small so you can redress it. So you can have different characters in it. And they say more important things. Or they're like, I'm going to build a house, and my my house is going to have you know, three bedrooms, and then a bathroom, and then it's going to have a huge hallway, and then it's going to have a mega big kitchen, and then it's going to have... It's like, no. Smaller. As small as humanly possible. Because your hub world exists to be redressed. And if you can't redress it quickly and efficiently, your hub world is way too big. You want to be able to take anyone out, put anyone in. You want to be able to hang anything from the walls. You want to be able to punch holes in those walls. Anything. But it needs to be fast and tight and easy. You don't want to have to waste a lot of time redressing parts of the world that are not important. And that's why these small hub worlds are so nice. It's just one building. Three rooms. But there's more to it than that. Because these hub worlds are specifically designed to allow you to say things by simply placing characters in specific positions. Here's a top-down view. This is the, um, uh, the, the, the main hut, main uh, area. It's got this giant stone area out here where anybody can be, and it's huge. It dominates this entire area, and any, anybody you put here is going to dominate this side of the region, and that's going to say a lot about what they think about themselves, uh, what the devs want you to notice, that sort of stuff. So when you get here and you see that there are two people sunning themselves and making bracelets, you immediately think, okay, these are the only two people in the area. They obviously think very highly of themselves. Um, they are dominating this entire region. And when you talk to them, they are actually doing exactly that. They're like, we're making friendship bracelets for our friends you don't even have any of those. They're obviously doing that sort of thing. And that's something that they partially communicated simply by putting them on a literal pedestal. And if we talk about the same thing, so we're back to the side view here. Here are the people we just talked about. 
stunning themselves and making bracelets. Here is the cabin, and then there's like a little walkway over here, and in the shadows stands your love interest. And you know, when you go over to her, she'll say something, but she's standing in the shadows. She's standing in an area where you'll notice her, but she's not really taking anybody's attention. She's not dominating any areas. She's ob she's off on her own. She's obviously just not fitting in. It works very, very well. Just by having a little side area where she can stand, you immediately create the opportunity to put anyone in that little side area and make it clear that they are alone, that they don't fit in, that they are not as dominant in this part of the game. Similarly, there's jumping puzzles. And one of those jumping puzzles, here's, here's the roof. One of those jumping puzzles is going out to a crow's nest. And what do you think will happen if you put specific people in this crow's nest, looking down over the crowds and saying weird, creepy things? Well, that's got something very specific to say. They're in a specific place, looking down, dominating this entire area, but from a secret position. That says that they're plotting in secret, that they're, you know, they're looking out over this huge area. It suits them very, very well. Everybody looks like ants from up there. That's the whole point. By having a region like this in the hub world, you have the opportunity to put people in that region. And obviously this isn't like a one use thing. You could put anybody up in the crow's nest and have them say anything you like. It's not always gonna be about you know evil plans and making people look like ants, but it's always gonna have this feeling of being off on its own, above but aloof, secretive, that sort of thing. It's always gonna feel like those sorts of, uh, of emotions and that's going to tie it together. The interior is the same way. It's only three rooms, but the central room, here's the, the other two rooms, the central room has a giant raised platform. And the first time you encounter it, there's a band playing on it. And they're fun, and you're supposed to notice them, and they are great fun, right? But you can replace that band with anybody you want. For example, you could just put a person sitting up here and looking lonely. Now, that person sitting up there and looking lonely doesn't have any you know, like personal reason that they would be dominating this entire area, but they're on the stage. So if you walk in and you see one person sitting there looking lonely, you're going to think, ooh. And that's a great opportunity for the writer to put in whatever sort of powerful emotions they want. Like they're stuck on the stage, but they're alone or something similar to that because the stage means something. It dominates the area and it says very specific things about the nature of the world. If you're on a stage, that means that you're performing or that you're in front of everybody or that everybody can see you or that you're on a pedestal. And those are things that you can write into whatever you're trying to say. And these are important. These sorts of topological constraints allow you to talk to the player before they've even tried to open conversation. You can immediately tell the player you should feel that this person is like this. That's really cool. That's great. You should be able to do that. And this is a basic core conceit of this kind of world. Now, similarly, there are nooks where you can basically hide people. So this room has a TV in it, and you'll occasionally find people hanging out here, hiding and watching TV, and you immediately know that they are just off on the side. They're not involved. They're not interested. They are doing something else, and they do not care because that's what that room says. Pretty basic. That's the sort of thing you need to think about when you're creating your hub worlds. Now let's talk about small versus big, because we could create a hub world that was all of the hub worlds from Psychonauts combined. We could create one giant hub world where you've got that ranger cabin, and then you've got the kids' cabins down here, and then you've got the beaches over here, you know, and then you've got the main forest campground over here. We could make it all one big world, and we could blur it all together so that there's no uh, real borders or anything. But that becomes very difficult. Let's just give an example from the existing one. If we're standing at the front of the ta uh, of the uh, cabin, or even on the roof of the cabin, what we'll see is a really cool path that leads down into. A, uh, a parking lot, and the parking lot has this massive, pretty gate. Now, this is pretty dominant. I mean, this is a place that you're probably going to go and explore pretty quick. Uh, and in truth, there are actually other things involved. There's like a path over here and stuff. But this is obviously the topological dominant feature of that side of the map. But even though it's super topologically dominant, 
putting someone out here wouldn't actually work very well for making them dominant because it's so far from where the player is going to be. Them dominating the parking lot is literally like saying they're a big fish in a small pond. They're off in the middle of nowhere dominating nothing. Congrats. That can be very powerful if it was like Bobby Zilch or something, a bully. That can be very powerful. But it's not going to be something that every player sees. It's not going to be something every player notices because it's so far away from where the player is. If we were going to build one giant hub world with everything integrated together, the cabin also becomes that. Putting someone on that giant center stage, well, if that center stage is not center stage and it's just one place that they might go, then it's not center stage anymore and they're on a really lonely stage in the middle of nowhere. And that's not what we wanted to say. We want to have a center stage and if there's no center, we can't do that. And that's why when you're building your hub worlds, small. Small is easier to redress, small is easier to focus, small is easier to make sure that you actually are know where the player is and what they're doing. Just make your hub worlds small. Please, I'm really tired of walking across hub worlds for 10 minutes. That shouldn't be how they are. You almost never want a big hub world. The only time you want a bigger hub world is when the player is going to unlock more hub world. For example, if this is the cabin down here, what they might have done if they had a lot of extra RAM is they may have had some kind of thing off here. They, they do have similar things to this, right? But there could be something off there in the world, and you wouldn't be able to reach it except with a special power, like a triple jump or something, or a, or a glide. So if you had a special power like that, you could reach it. Having this in the same map does say something. It says this is a Metroidvania game, and you're going to be able to go over there someday. That is something that you might want to say. And in that case, your hub world could have this sort of stuff in it, but you need to remember that this is not really part of your hub world. Even when the player gets that special power, it's unlikely that that's going to be like center of their, of their experience. That's just a tiny little thing off in the middle of nowhere. So in general, when you're making hub worlds, you can have as much background stuff as you want, but remember, it's background stuff. I don't want to have to navigate it. No one can be there except for like, secrets just for you know sake of having secrets it's not a place the player is going to notice it's not a place the player is going to visit except if they're a weird completionist so when you are talking about hub world you really want to focus on the place you know the player will be and that's generally going to be one thing one thing right in the center of your hub world other examples in the same game psychonauts the hub world for the children's um uh shacks or huts or whatever you want to call them campground looks a little bit like this and then there is a huge frigging tree with giant frigging stairs leading up it and obviously you're supposed to notice the huge tree this hub world doesn't get as much attention uh, i don't think it's as good a hub world which is fine your hub worlds don't all have to be equal but um, there are fewer places that you can place people in this hub world because the centerpiece this giant tree is actually above where you're going to be navigating so you've got this giant tree house way up here and then you've got this tree coming down and down and down and down and down uh, and then you've got all of the actual things down here where you know there's the exits to the other places and all the places to explore and this tree is just kind of off on its own even though it's huge and it draws all your attention it's not the heart of the level so putting things up in the tree is just putting them off to the side they're in oleander's braining camp rather than you know participating in the hub world which means that all of the characters in this kind of hub world are just kind of bumming around on the dirt down here or maybe in a cabin and that's just about your only option now with clever riding you can still make those experiences very interesting like someone's trying not to explode squirrels or someone is spying on an empty cabin for practice or someone is trying to determine the name of their band or whatever those can be a lot of fun but topologically they're not compelling no one's on the center stage no one's hidden in a corner they're all kind of just muddling around so when you're designing your hub worlds make sure you know where the player is going to be what they're going to see what they're going to consider to be center stage where they're going to want to go all of these things are critical and these things are much easier to answer if your hub world is teeny tiny. Anyway, hopefully this was useful to somebody. I will see you folks around.